Once again, if you have any personal questions or something, uh, keep it for the end. Right? Uh, otherwise, for all perpetuity, your great grandchildren will hear you say all this. Once again, if you have any personal questions, So we get started, folks. Uh, there's also an auto recording. Uh, by the way, some of you, uh, I'll try to also make the auto recordings available to everyone. So some of you who prefer textual transcripts of these talks can do that. I don't promise it. Unfortunately, as you can see, it is a one man army plus plus, the plus plus being all the people who have all been kindly volunteering and helping me uh, set up the place clean the place, do various course on this place. So, uh, and a huge shout out from my side for all of you who, have, who feel who are part of the community and have been helping us here. Mm -hmm. uh, as a commercial enterprise, it's part commercial, part community driven, and I really appreciate the community spirit. So uh, starting with that, today is day three. And one thing I must say that having run boot camps, um, and this is the first one for the longest time because of the pandemic, the boot camps had come to a pause. Only the workshops are going on. And uh, during the pandemic, a bit of personal history, uh, I, I would go to Google, for example, and one of the things is meet some friends there. And uh, the co consistent feedback I got from them was that, hey, the venue working from office or attending classrooms, especially going to classrooms to attend lectures is so passe, it's so over. Sell your place, right? And invest in all virtual technologies. And they are well-meaning, they are right. If you notice, Google is heavily invested in the digital classroom, uh, their software, and they have something wonderful to offer. But somewhere in my heart, I always felt that Learning takes place when two friends talk and share. And when people come together, they go through the struggles of trying to make something work. See, learning takes place in the crucible of frustration, trying, experimentation, and eventually getting it to work somehow. Because that's how you really learn. We don't learn from books. We do learn from books. We do learn from for example, the lecture sessions that I give, we do learn from the guided labs, the solutions. But the real learning comes when you do on your own and absolutely nothing works. And uh, part of my uh, project design is that when you, you, you go through this, uh, what, in, uh, what, uh, what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey, Anything worthwhile, if you notice, and, it, and this is the, the archetype of all mythologies, and it is also an archetype, I believe, of every uh, non-trivial endeavor of your life. And Campbell put it as a beautiful blueprint, the hero's journey. The hero's journey is there is a calling. You feel you need to do something. This is really worth doing. In your case, this AI la learning large language models at depth, not at the level of just some POC code, five lines from the web. But really knowing how to do it is important. It is, for example, if you want to do something non-trivial with them, you have to learn that. It's a calling. You come here, then the going gets tough. And uh, it's what's called the belly of the beast. Right? What seemed very promising, uh, the, the promised land looks more and more distant. right? And uh, you, you're in the belly of the beast where you wonder why exactly did you embark on this foolish journey and uh, nothing works absolutely nothing works your id whether you're using pycharm or visual studio code is not cooperating with you your uh, life when you google search all the examples are solutions so-called solutions to your problem uh, turn out to be misleading and that's the best part right you copy a snippets from the web and they don't work they don't solve you. How many of you have been through that experience in this project? Quite a few of you, right? And that's when you begin to feel, oh goodness, it's all hopeless. How are we going to do this? Okay. And uh, I hope that you persisted. Uh, in fact, I do know that most teams persisted. And I see most of you coming out the other end uh, with a little bit of a guidance. Um, and 
I've been trying to come and guide you or somebody, sometimes another team member or somebody else comes and guides you, but you crack the problem essentially. And most of you are now close to wrapping it up. I don't know of any team I, that has completely wrapped it up and feels that we, we are about to launch with a product. Um, so we will take uh, today, what we'll do is two things. I will explain what the next project is. And yes, we are going to release the next project. But I've slightly taken half the project for this week and pushed some for and added it to the project afterwards because the project that was coming next week, I felt had space in it. It, it is a interesting topic, a completely different topic, Rag. But at the same time, it is not a difficult topic. So a couple of things from this week, I pushed to that week. This week I kept for two things. You really, really wrap up your project properly. And you add the few uh, this week's project elements to it, which I think is very doable now. You guys have all uh, found your stride. You have developed uh, a cadence now. And this cadence will take you through. You'll enjoy it, the struggle in the beginning. And most of the struggle, if you realize, was the learning curve, the teething issues, They're struggling with this, struggling with Docker, uh, struggling with the APIs, getting your hang with that. But now that you're comfortable with it, the huge potential barrier that was there to doing things in, in a real sense now is crossed. And I think it will be smooth sailing. It, I mean, it will never be smooth sailing. There are a few turbulencies around, but uh, you will make good progress now. It will be much more rapid progress than the slow progress you have had in the beginning. And I promise you that you'll see uh, much more interesting and more core AI results coming. Uh, frankly, the first project was not so much AI. I mean, obviously, all the pieces were there in your uh, Jupyter notebooks. It was more the data engineering. It is the mechanics of building something big. It's foundations. It is the part that goes below the ground is no more visible. But with these strong foundations, now you'll do real AI. So the problem that I will give you today will be in the flavor of problems that are going to come in the following year. In other words, I will not give you very detailed instructions. I will give you an objective. Each team can achieve the objective in one of many ways. And to find the real way would be an exercise in AI, not exercise in a data engineering, but real exercise in AI, knowing which approach works, why it works. And the bake off at the end of this second week's, I mean, third week's project would be how well is your team's model actually working right? or for the task? So once again, you, you notice I keep quoting Tolstoy, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own unique way. Right? So each of your projects are incomplete or imperfect in all your, all your unique ways that I have, have, some of you have told me what they are and some of you know. Of course, that's the nature of progress. Right? Everything in engineering is forever work in progress. You have to know that. Right? But so long as it is useful, it's good. Uh, Box, the great data scientist, what you would say, or statistician said famously that all models are wrong, but some are useful. We are not in pursuit of the right solution because there are no right solutions in AI. All models are wrong. But are, is what you have done useful at all? That is the fundamental question that you have to answer. Have you taken it to the point of business utility, real world utility, what you have built? You may have built the most elegant architecture. You may use the fanciest mathematics. If it is of no utility, you have failed. On that benchmark, actually, I happen to notice that most teams have failed because you have not picked a good data set. But most teams have done an incredibly, incredibly good job. Um, I almost was disheartened after the bootcamp, the last bootcamp was before the pandemic. There was a lot of energy. People used to stay here till two in the night and so a lot of debates and so forth. But uh, this time I felt the, the world culture has changed. I don't know how, how much energy people will bring. And it's, well, it is really heartening to see how much effort each of you have put in. A lot of effort, right? And obviously when you are in intense effort, engineers are a litigious community. No two engineers can ever agree. 
between three engineers, there are five opinions, right? And I'm sure you guys are seeing that in your respective teams, right? There will be frustrations. All the usual human drama uh, that takes place. Somebody is working hard and somebody is hardly working. Somebody is uh, very good at one thing, but poor at the other. But that's what teams are. That's what human communities are. Uh, this, your team is a microcosm of humanity trying to achieve something. And uh, take it in stride. I've heard, I know what, what is happening in each team. I would say, take it in stride. And part of learning is this too. Effective engineering teams is not made out of titans. Effective engineering teams are made out of simple people like you and me doing great things because they have learned to work together. This is one thing I would say, because I do know, and I do, I've seen frustration on many faces. This is one thing I would say. Go anywhere and see the people who have achieved great things. You will realize that it was the first great thing they achieved. Usually they are not people who are known to be rock stars. Rock stars actually get into a room and debate and debate and debate and debate. And six months later, they are still debating, right? Because each one wants to lead, nobody wants to do it. The doers are always people like you and me, and great things are achieved. There's a saying that great things are done when men and mountains meet. So, and you guys are meeting mountains. You guys are climbing very steep learning curves at this moment of the mountains. So all kudos to you on that front. But uh, nonetheless, you meet, while it is great progress, it is no outcome. Because not one of the teams so far have, and it's, a, it's one thing I want to point out as engineers that we get very enamored of our tools and the things we do with those tools, the code we write, the elegance of it, right? But at the end of it, however elegant a bridge is, if it is a bridge between nowhere and nowhere, right? uh, it, it serves no purpose. So the, the most elemental task, which I knew you guys would struggle with is, what, what problem, real world problem are you solving with it? And it was simply the problem of picking a good corpus. In that, the usual things have come. The most common thing picked up in this world are Wikipedia, archive, right? News feeds, Twitter. How many of you fell into that trap? Twitter, some news feeds, Wikipedia, archive. And or some variant of archive, bio archive or something like that, right? So guys, if you're doing that, you are trotting a path that millions have trod, treading a path that millions have already trodden. Go off the beaten track, create something useful, guys. There are fields crying out for help. Yeah. Guess what, for example, anthropologists would do if you took their vast knowledge or some uh, small field of uh, people studying for example, in Dology, the study of or the archaeology of Indian and archaeology and Indian history dug up from uh, real experimental evidence and so forth. Uh, what would people do who are tracing the uh, migration of humanity across the continents? Vast corpuses of knowledge are waiting for your help. You guys are great and genius. You're building something wonderful. Trust me. All you need to do is take a corpus, which most people have ignored, and there are thousands of such document corpuses, and light it up. Feed it into your, don't just feed Wikipedia, don't just feed archive or Twitter. Twitter is, it gives you a need. What is it nowadays called X, right? So uh, forget the X's and the Y's, pick something reasonable, right, better. Rather than the uh, rather than the incessant chatter, incessant and essentially meaningless chatter that these social medias have become, pick something useful. That's one advice I'll give you. Uh, now, with that, uh, I'll come back to brass tacks, and I apologize if this sounded like a bit of hectoring yeah. or lecturing. But uh, brass tacks, I will be coming to each of your rooms, seeing uh, you know, giving you a bit of advice. But today afternoon right after the lunch, we have a one event. I will have all the teams present their work. Now, there is no expectation of closure, right? Uh, 
but there is expectation of progress an expectation that you're emerging from the belly of the beast you all are seeing hope now at this point you are, you have hope that your project is finishing and it is reaching some approximation of closure pretty soon or within a reasonable time frame so that is uh, that itself is a great achievement i want all of your teams to present it one by one there are there are seven teams we look forward to seven presentations each presentation will take about uh, half an hour to 40 minutes now in these presentations i have a request guys the request is candor see there are two things we can do there is a thing in uh, leadership circles if you are ever and you sort of go through right? uh, people often use the word radical candor i don't know is the term familiar to anyone radical candor what does it mean ask me the right time, the right feedback, so the person has a chance to act on it, to stop holding it, pause for later, and then realizing That's that right. she has to think that the person has no chance of... Uh, That's right. Thank you. Thank you. And Masmi said it right. She says, you need to be candid and say it, but with compassion. There is no radical candor of value. It leads to warfare, unless there is compassion and kindness. But be candid, guys. Honesty. And kindness are the best yardsticks for giving feedback. Be kind first, but be honest. If you just say yes, yes, good, and you remember that, oh, you know, these three things, this guy got wrong, this team got wrong, oops. You're not helping each other. We grow when we help each other grow. It is your responsibility. Trust me, guys, I am one person, and in no way am I better than you. It just so happens that on this topic, I have a little bit more experience than you. On other topics, you have more experience, a more, a more insights to bring. But collectively, as a community, if we genuinely share and learn, no, not, no learning environment is so productive as a sharing, a shared learning experience. It is the evidence of many, many education studies. And as you know, for me, I have a passion, not just in engineering, but in pedagogy and education theories. And I'm telling you that everything boils down to relationships and social learning. And social learning means giving honest feedback and helping each other out, but with, with radical candor, but with kindness and constructive uh, spirit. Right? In Deloitte, I believe, there is a, there, I believe it's Deloitte, in one of the consulting, or McKinsey, I forget which of the two, there is a phrase, it said, an obligation to dissent. Anybody knows about it? If you're in a meeting and everybody is agreeing to something, but you know it's wrong, you cannot. It is unethical to stay quiet. You have an obligation to dissent. You have an obligation to say that, could, you, could we have done it differently? Don't say that, hey, you're absolutely wrong. What rubbish. I reserve the right to say that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, but we can also say, could, could, it, could it have been this way? Right? Um, I, I saw somewhere that this too works. Have you, have you looked into that? Isn't it? A, a Socratic way of asking probing questions rather than serving your pre-cooked answers goes a long way. In fact, that way, if you look at the peripatetic philosophers of Greece, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, you notice that the, the entire mode of conversation of dialogue was questions, not answers, questions. You can always lead people with questions because questions don't bruise egos or they do it less. So lead with questions, please. And please do have, uh, so now I'll come to your main obligation here, guys. In the afternoon, once you are well fortified with food, uh, Try not to fall asleep, <laughs> but uh, be lively and very openly, very candidly debate it out. Is it the best way? I would love it if all of us debate everything out. I mean, engineers uh, are a litigious community. That's what we are good at, right? Uh, if anybody says we should go north, everybody will tell you, you don't even have a definition of north. Do you mean magnetic north? Geographical not, which not, right? And why should we go not, right? This is what engineers are. 
uh, I want to see that spirit, but in, but towards the goal of helping us all learn. Are we together? Right. So please do that in the afternoon. I, I expect you to do that. And uh, no, no one has finished it. Actually, I don't get much time because I have a business to run, and we try to. I try to create some snippets to give you guys to guide you through the solution. I'll walk you through some of them. So if it is any consolation, nor have I finished the whole solution. I mean, I've done it, but uh, not to the full perfection. And uh, uh, after a little while, you say that, okay, it will be obvious now to students to do the rest exactly like this, right? So there is a bit of that here. Uh, I'll sh walk you through some parts of it, of how I did it, but I want to do that. Well, that's a question for you guys. Should I do it now or should I do it after everybody's presentation and some effort to close? After, okay, so we'll do it after. So then in that time, so guys, please, I have a request. Do, I beg you, be very participatory, right? Bring your best arguments from a constructive perspective, right? Where is, which knot are we talking about? Magnetic or not, right? Uh, go at it. Let's debate each other out and also take those feedback in a constructive way. Right? Remember, it's a learning community. None of us are trying to outcompete the other for that uh, any prize like promotion or pleasing the boss or anyone. There's no one to please. There's no there's no promotion. There's nothing. Right? Whatever st happens in this room stays in the room. And and of course, uh, as a basic code of ethics, I hope you will all honor that. That whatever we discuss, don't take it out. Don't share it with others. It's a learning community. Learning community needs a sense of trust. So trust. Or whatever you see in each other teams, go, don't go and talk about it. We are a learning community. So we, can, we can give honest and blunt feedback to each other only if we know that the receiving person knows that feedback will never be shared outside the community. So that's it. That's the spirit in which the last boot camp happened. I would hope that we continue the same spirit. And I would call it that. If, if we can continue the spirit, I would be really proud that in support vectors we posted that spirit. Yeah? So that's so. What is today's camp about? Today's boot camp has one objective: search for the longest time has been dominated with text because of its roots. Its roots was in text-based search, keywords-based search, isn't it? A keywords pop up by by their very nature; they're linguistic artifacts. Isn't it? So, to the extent that they're linguistic artifacts, we have created a large amount of technology and a subject of natural language processing and information retrieval has machined and grown for the last 50 years. Right? Uh, for a long, long time, it's been happening. But, and obviously, you all know where I'm leading to, but I would like to step back and take a little bit broad uh, perspective, a more philosophical perspective, and ask you, what is a language? And I want to debate on that because this is crucial. What is the purpose of a language? And what is the definition? What is the essence? What is the quintessence of a language? What is it that you call a language? Anyone? Go ahead. To communicate meaningfuls, to convey the context. To, yes. So to, to communicate something, it could start with perhaps, if you look at the formation of language, very elemental things, basic needs for survival. Uh, there, is a, there is a bull charging at you, at a person. Your back is turned to the bull and your friend would like to, Communicate the danger to you. And of that comes a mutually agreed word. That means the same thing to both of you. If, you. if your friend utters the word, you grasp the meaning of it and you, and you scoot off. Right? And so the essence of a language is, first of all, a shared something, something that we share isn't it? That means or evokes the same response in each of us. Are we together? Those are things. Our actions, run, should mean the same thing. 
right? And their conjunctions, their compositions leads to a more complex language. Go there and get me something, right? So if you remove the fact that in English, you would say that, and in uh, languages that have words like this would say that, uh, it would come out like that. But if you look at pictorial languages, the Egyptian hieroglyphics, and I believe it's partly true of um, traditional Chinese, you would just have words, pictures depicting those ideas. Right? It wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't have the uh, flowing sentences as in some other languages have. But ultimately is the shared experience, the shared community, a consensus that this is what this means whether it's a sound or it could be like today if you take a board and you paint it red doesn't matter what you write on it you just plant it next to a road what is a what is a collective response what is a conditioned response we immediately want to stop and see what it's about i don't know if the network connection is on yeah we lost network yeah it is. oh we lost network. People who are remote, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I am. Yes, yes, we can. So, um, all of you have lost network, or is you never had network when you came? We just lost it. We just lost it, and I think we seems to be reconnected. So, guys, uh, we are debugging this issue. It's been happening since yesterday evening. I don't know whether it is our mischief or it is AT and T's mischief. But it sort of tends to happen on Friday evenings and onwards. Uh, we'll debug it. And we, we are, uh, we'll find the root cause. Uh, we faced a similar problem in my office. Uh, if you have a business account, what happens is the box gets overloaded when there are a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it runs out of like mad tables and things. So like at and actually told us we won't get it. You they won't to, fix it. Yeah, you need to upgrade to the, the right side. And it happens when you have a lot of people connecting out and things. Okay. And thanks to Chrome, Chrome does this quick thing, which means every laptop is now kind of sending 20 connections. Oh, okay, guys. So I'll solve it. Thank you for telling me. I'll, I'll solve it somehow. Right? Uh, we will do some either network area translation or some something so that AT&T, as far as the AT&T router is concerned, it sees only one connection outbound and incoming. We'll do something on that, right? And that's where uh, Sukhpal is smiling because we are about to set up PFSense, an industrial strength firewall and uh, router here. Uh, hopefully that should solve all this. We always think we'll do it tomorrow uh, and the tomorrow never comes so far because we have all been so utterly busy. And uh, that's what happens. It's a, as you can imagine, we are a micro, like we are not even a startup, like in the traditional sense. Uh, they, they are businesses, they are small and medium businesses. Then they are just small mom and pop businesses. And that's what we are. It's literally a mom and pop shop. You guys must have seen uh, me and Samita <laughs> uh, there, but, but with great, great, great community support from all of you, which, which is the saving grace. Otherwise, there is no way the two of us would have been able to run this place, but we'll figure something out. All right, I apologize for this. Moving forward, now, I just changed the nature of the language. Did you see that? Red means something to us collectively. If you plant red board next to a highway, we all stop and then think, now what did we stop for, right? What is it? Is the rain, is the road washed out? What has happened? Uh, by the way, uh, if I may take a digression, uh, I'm reminded of a joke. Can I, can I tell a poor joke? My daughter says that there, 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 there are two things. There's poor joke, and then there are dad jokes. <laughs> and mine falls in the category of dad jokes, even worse. So there was a guy uh, holding a play card saying, no, the end is near, right? Now we all see that people you know, very passionately, end is near. Anytime a vehicle would come, he would wait, end is near. And then cars would just honk and get annoyed and run past it. And after a little while, you'll hear a crashing sound. So then after a little while, his friend comes and says, don't you think you should say more explicitly, the road is gone <laughs> <laughs> or the bridge is gone? <laughs> 
So, so that's about the nature of language, right? Language has inherent ambiguity, which is central to what we're doing. Machine learning would, if language was purely deterministic, one could argue that the value machine learning brings is somewhat diminished. The interpretation of language, there is always a certain degree of ambiguity, right? Mm -hmm. So are we saying, when we say fire, are we saying there's a fire burning or you need some fire to smoke, right? Or something like that. And um, whether we like it or not, our machine as cognitive engines does a very quick a probabilistic inference of which of the many meanings it could be, isn't it? And the more the context you give, the better, right? So think about it like this. If there is a picture of a fire and the sound, somebody is saying, and from a speaker, the word comes fire, fire, fire. Or, you know, there's, in, in the Western Hemisphere where we have this sirens, police sirens going on, uh, that is going on. It reinforces the message, isn't it? There's a multimodality to it. And that broadens the concept of a language. It brings about the fact that the visual artifacts too are a language, isn't it? Avocados get six. The person comes back with six bottles because they said, Yes, they were avocados. <laughs> <laughs> so we use that for engineering, which is very explicit. Water. So, what you mean? And yes. Six bottles. Yes. So, Moshe's joke was that a uh, wife asked the husband, Go to the house of milk. And if their avocados bring six, <laughs> husband returned with six bottles of milk because there were avocados present in the store. So, um, so yeah, that speaks to the ambiguity, guys. And that speaks to the, and that is where the fun begins. And I wanted to, this is a, this is a very good story, actually, because it brings about the crux of the point that it, machine, in some sense, uh, you need an inferential language, inferential machine, whether it's the human mind or an artificial intelligence, to decipher and overcome the inherent ambiguities of language, right? However precise you become with language, and people do, if you ever look at legal document, legalese is a language, a dialect of its own. And yet there's enough ambiguity that lawyers with their sharp minds poke holes in that and come up with an entirely different interpretation for it. Right? So one lesson to learn is language has ambiguities. Whether it's a, the other lesson that I wanted to bring, and therefore you need an inferential machine to process the language. It's a very important point I wanted to make. The third thing, and I'm just stepping back and giving you the way I look at this world here. The second thing is we are learning more and more. And this is one of the things that we are learning very dramatically. It was known in linguistics, computational linguistics, but it's much more known now in a very dramatic way, everyday way, with the coming in of transformers, right? Uh, something very amazing happened. For example, initially transformers were all about words because language was words. And then the paper, VIT paper, which we covered, you remember, in the neural architectures, we covered the paper. Somebody sliced up a picture into 16 by 16 pixel patches, into patches, right? And the technical details don't matter, but if you look at it as a set of patches and the patches are words of your sentence in a way, and you ask, well, does that make sense? Right? For example, if, you, if I want to show you a picture with two patches, a bear right, in pursuit and a person running, you could put the two together and have its translation into language by saying, there's a man running from a bear, right? Or if you want to, um, a if you want to exploit the ambiguities of the language, there is a man chasing a bear, <laughs> right? One of the two uh, interpretations are possible, right? And that's where you use the background knowledge, the training to know which is more probable. 
right? And that's where these models come in, language models come in. So you slice, you patch it up into pictures. Then it raises this question, if we can do a semantic embedding of sentence, haven't we just considered this photo, this picture, this scripture picture, isn't it a narrative? And therefore, why should it also not have a first class citizenship in your metropolis of meanings that we have been talking about, that we have been building? You see the obviousness of it from that. And of course, it puts up, I mean, today, since we have done all of this, this will come to you as a review, because we have done all of this clip, blip, blip to video llama, and so on and so forth. And I won't go in it because these are all clues to your uh, current lab. So I uh, forget that I used any of those words. Right. I was probably talking about hair clips. So our uh, paper clips. So your project today is to expand your language or the, the things that you search for, expand it minimally, first part, to images. Secondly, to expand it to audio, part two. Audio remains your stretch goal. Image remains your primary. Now, but this is a project, but there, remember every week, we'll have the easy part and the hard part. Right. So I'll give you the easy part. Yeah. So you need to be able to embed in your current embedding space, vector space, pictures and audio files, sound recordings. Right. What did we miss in this? That's coming more. Our depth data and uh, thermal data and things like that, right? And astrophysical data. So if you talk to astrophysicists, they'll say, I'm looking at the sky. You would think that this, oh, how, how utterly poetic he was be looking at the stars. And he'll come back with data on the baryon distribution in some corner of the galaxy. And you say, what is this? Oh, this is the distribution of protons. And did you see it? No, my telescope saw it, right? I, I'm, I'm kidding. Well, that's what NASA does. Most of the, you know, most of those beautiful evocative pictures of NASA that you see, uh, you realize, of course, that those are not real pictures. Right? Yeah, those are post-processing of just data. Yeah, you can't, we can't see X-ray, the X-ray picture of the galaxy, the gamma ray picture of the galaxy. Right? Those are all radio, deep radio wave, yes. Acceptance criteria, you need to go for 4K or something, you have some more explicit instruction. For the oh, yes, I will. I will give you the details. But okay. let me talk at a high level. So, guys, images. So, minimum is here is the minimum, which is very easy because it's there in your solutions in the past. But I want to do it at scale. You are allowed to create a completely new index to search from, which contains only short sentences. Why I'm giving you this. Uh, calling this an easier problem, you will learn when you do it. For some reason, those are a lot easier to go with, literally. And that is the, that is the easy part of it, part, you know, think of it as your, uh, uh, the easy part of the project, right? the first project. The second project, which is the real project is, it should be able to search for arbitrarily long things. So, Here's the benchmark, guys. If I show you a picture of, let's say, a girl playing hopscotch, you should be able to find in text all sorts of texts that talk about hopscotch and girls relevantly. Because there is a narrative there. It's not just a girl. If you come up with pictures of a girl, that's not enough. The context is important. It should contextualize and be able to come up with it. Are we together? So this is your thing. Uh, and we, where are we heading? I'll give you a little bit of an idea of where we are heading. See, so far we have not used a large language model. It's a large language model boot camp. We are getting ready to use that. Right? But Large language models are highly defective machines. They're easily misled and they get into trouble. We are building the foundation so that we can guide 
the narratives. Next week, next week's project was, we will use large language models to derive coherent and many, many hallucinating narratives out of questions we asked. Those narratives, and for example, here's uh, your project for the subsequent weeks, is one of them is you, you ask it for a narrative, it should be able to produce a Wikipedia-like page but containing <laughs> pictures, containing text, narratives, original narratives, not search results, generated out of content that it believes is pertinent. Are we together? And it should use your index as a guide to not hallucinate. We are going there. And part of your next weeks would be not only to generate a narrative, but to make sure that somewhere in there, there is at least one or two haikus, right? Or whatever form of poetry that you most like. Sonnets. I'm so sorry, what is the point of a haiku? Because this is interesting. I've heard this more than once. So, um, but I was not given a response before. What is the point of uh, asking somebody to write a haiku? See, haiku is one way that I would say it is. Uh, if you if you don't like haikus, you say, well, that's it. But if you like haikus, you would say, let's see, haikus capture the essence of human experience or some wisdom in the least number of words possible. Good haikus, not just simple haikus, but good haikus contain a lot of wisdom in the least number of words possible. Does this have to have good spelling? Because I know haikus don't have commas and uh, stop words and, you know, um, uh, dashes and things like that. But it's just like a poetry with a bunch of words like flowers bloom, uh, let go this, you know. So, um, yes, they capture the essence. But in terms of English grammar, punctuation and language, how does that um, how, how does how does that help us test a language model is my question. Okay, now this is a good question, Shall we, and again, this is where I would say a change your lens two ways. See, if, if the essence of language is to communicate, and one of the most things that we really want to communicate in any language is the essence of the human condition. Like, I mean, life throws problems and human beings respond to those, the struggle, the experience, the experience of the human condition with all its ups and downs. Every land, every country has tried to create poetry that best captures it, right? There is a term, for example, in Urdu, uh, a, lang, uh, a sort of a poetry form that I uh, am very fond of. Uh, quite often you can say a lot with very few words. I come from a place called Benares, which is, which has Kabir, the poet, who uh, says the so-called Dohas, very short sayings, two-liners, but it captures a lot of the essence of human condition. And you look across the different cultures and you find that very often people try to create memorable little sort of poetries. Brevity, brevity is there, uh, is the descriptive or the essence of what that form of poetry is. How can you be very um, brief and say a lot? And I, I would say that in the Japanese culture, haiku was it. Though obviously the way haiku is now interpreted in the West, uh, it is hardly haiku. I mean, it is, it's more fun or jokes than real haiku. Like you said, a flower, the moon, right? Well, it may create a positive emotion. Well, there's something to it. But if you say flower, the truck, I don't know what it would be. Yeah, I think yeah, I think most of these large language models, even as I test them, test them for hallucination, I find that um, they're, you know, it definitely depends on what, it, obviously, you know, as engineers, we know it's definitely what they're training on. And I think I've spoken to you about this before, that where people are looking into the Sanskrit language and, you know, and sentence structure and things like that. But this is thousands of years old because they, it, 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 this person believes it's the seat of civilization and that's kind of where people really learn to express emotions uh, for the first time so this is this person's belief having said that um you know in the several months of this project nothing has 
nothing has happened and their conclusion was this is a civilization that's a uh, thousands of years old. <laughs> we can't structure this into one thing so so then now he this prayer he's he's all into reading piranhas which is a little funny to me because you know i was born a hindu um which so he's now into reading piranhas to really understand that i mean this person is not of indian descent or yes yes uh, I, I, I don't yeah know. yeah so um now he's into reading piranhas to figure all this out so that's kind of why when you mention haiku i sorry to interrupt but you know it's it's it, there are people out there who have access to several different large languages language models and they're looking at um ancient in Indian scriptures as training models and they want to translate it but they don't he's like I don't feel like we have enough words in English so I'll leave it at that yes I mean see one thing is true that uh, this was a hypothesis by this great linguist uh, oh goodness today uh, it's amazing we tend to forget the most elemental fact but one person said that the languages are prisons that limit the range of thoughts and emotions you can have right? and different languages have different sort of sets of things they cover and emphasize um, so every language is a prison it's limited there are every you can take any other language and you can find things that it says for which there is no equivalent in english for example many many languages there are many words that i have found in english and people have often told me, because uh, especially coming from India, there is a very strong chauvinism that absolutely Indian languages are the epitome of perfection. It can express everything. Very easily, you can produce words in any language that have no Indian equivalent whatsoever. Right? So uh, and it, it again goes to the fact that human beings are very versatile everywhere, and they also have they, based on what they value, their language evolves. So language evolves with emphasis. What do you value? Right? If you live in snow country, I'm sure you would have a hundred descriptions of cold. Okay? But if you live in the tropics, you probably have one word because cold isn't quite common. Right? So, so well, uh, but 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 uh, Sani, I'll just make a joke. Uh, the the best of research is done when somebody is having a lot of fun but calling it research, <laughs> right? Because that's when great things happen. Great things happen when you don't know that you'll succeed at all, or you have no idea why you're doing what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, it's applied research and generally of mediocre quality. It is useful, it will advance progress, but the best is done when you have no clue what you're doing. So all kudos to that researcher you're referring to. So yeah. other guys, yeah, okay. uh, with that, uh, I will I will say that uh, it's getting to be 11. I would like to spend the next hour going to your rooms and sitting with all of you, preparing you for your presentation after lunch. Lunch will be there at 12, um, the same lunch. Right? Oh, by the way, I must say thing, this thing about lunch. I do realize that the lunch here, it can be repetitive, right? and um, there, there can be uh, very specific dietary requirements. I um, I ask for your forbearance and patience. Support vectors uh, is not is not a VC funded startup, right? It's a mom and pop business. It's a mom and pop shop. Uh, whatever tuition you gave at this moment is not going in our pockets. It has never in the six years of support vectors existence. All the tuition is any facility that you see here, including this microphone, the tables you are sitting on, the the chairs. By the way, each of the chairs you are sitting on are thousand dollar chairs. They're Herman Miller Aaron chairs. All the tuition, everything that you see here is a past student's tuition. And the tuition that has come for this course cannot afford specific dietary requirements. So if you have that, I please uh, forgive our limitation. Go out and have your lunch. We really can't do that. The food is, a, you wouldn't call it the most healthy food, but once in a while, comfort food also works. Right? I think of it like this. When you are at home, you'll be too strict. You wouldn't eat this food at home. You'd feel too guilty getting it. But when it is in front of you and you're hungry, it is totally okay to eat it, isn't it? So that's that. 
The other request is, guys, uh, at the end of the day, I have one request. Uh, do please empty your room of utensils. Uh, uh, we try to load the dishwasher every day, but we can uh, do it much better. And for the hygiene of your rooms, it's much better if dirty dishes are not uh, lying there. And on, or, uh, you know, we don't find uh, dirty spoons lying on the floor because people just left it there. It fell down, nobody picked it up. I need a little bit of community support in keeping this place running. The students too, for example, yes, they went to the football, um, they went to the World Cup and they cleaned up the rack, the seats that they were sitting on when they left. Yes. And I, I am amazed by the hygiene and the stuff that Japanese, like they're very, very conscious yes. of uh, cleaning up after themselves being built. Yes, yes. So yeah, it is to see that at the global stage. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, Japanese are amazingly clean. Um, Mosby mentions that Japanese are so clean they went to the World Cup, and when they got out of their seats, they cleaned all around them. Yeah. Right. So uh, let's do one thing. Uh, let's keep this as a North Pole, and make baby steps towards it. <laughs> Small baby steps. Right. So just, just just get your utensils out of your room, put them there, the rest will take care of And keep your room reasonably clean, right? Uh, it should keep it reasonably hygienic. That, that's all I would say for each of the teams. So guys, uh, now I will come to your rooms. I'll help you all with code. That's what this week is about. Get started with a new project. This project, guys, I do expect you to finish in a week. It is not a hard project. It's an incremental advancement over the current week. So, what, what resources available for this uh, for training? Uh, oh, uh, if you, yeah, oh, by the way, one benchmark. So, guys, one benchmark. You should be able, on the servers that you have been given, you should be able to create a search index of at least a thousand pictures for the, and the inference server, the big inference server will now soon be available to you guys because you're reaching the level. Actually, the first time you'll really have it is when we use the large language model, which will be from next week, right? But then you will all get a timeshare on the big inference server. And this week we are creating a, a, something called, something like a Docker, it's called uh, Podmans, which are Docker equivalents, is the new thing right? uh, beyond Docker. So we are creating Podmans for every team. So each team will have a Podman, you can run whatever you want on the Podman. If all the stars in the sky are uh, sky are aligned, we might also be su be successful in putting the perimeter security and VPN, so you guys can just directly VPN. But remember that you get your Podman one day of the week, yeah? and I'll tell which team gets which day of the week. Okay? Um, and obviously, uh, for other days, since I control the Podman you'll find that your podman has been unceremoniously and rudely stopped. <laughs> right? Thus, that infants machines are powerful. They are four GPU behemoths. Use them wisely and plan for your use. Like, be ready for it. It shouldn't be that your turn has come and you have no plan how to use it. Those are precious resources. Right? Also, by the way, just like carbon trading, if, if your team hasn't used it as a resource, you can, you can put your... Uh, other team in debt. I give you my day today, but later on I need the day back. You can do some day training. All right, guys. So with that, let's get and get started. Day trading. I got a different meaning of day trading. Literally, yes. <laughs>